In this series of videos, we'll be talking about how to collect data using something like a survey. Now, it's really important to understand how to do this if you're actually going to be designing a survey, but almost more important is doing this so that you can understand how to critique a survey. That is, if somebody else collects data on your behalf and you have to vet whether that data is collected in a manner that's appropriate, you need to know what the survey instrument looks like. And you need to know if the practices that were taken in designing that were up to spec or if they were not so good at all. So the main thrust of the next series of videos is about survey design and how you can be critical in understanding if it was done well or if it was done poorly. So the outline for these videos is gonna be broken up into two parts. First, we're gonna talk about understanding the use of specific scales and how that works. And then we'll shift gears to questionnaire construction and design. So the whole point of measurement is to take an idea that is this fuzzy construct in somebody's head and convert it into a numerical representation. For example, if I ask you how likely you are to buy something, in your head, you don't have a number you have some vague concept. But what we've learned through the study of psychometrics is that people can actually convert that vague fuzzy concept into a numerical representation using a scale like the one on the screen. That's not to say that there's only five possible representations of how likely you are to buy a product, but this is a reasonable proxy of this continuum from very little to very much. And what we'll see as a theme emerging in all of these types of questions is that, again, we're trying to take a concept that is in someone's head and convert it into something numerical so that we can actually analyze it and interpret it and compare people and compare groups and compare products and so on and so forth. Now, there's generally four types of scales, and I'll describe each one here so you get a flavor for it. And then you'll get a chance to understand this a little bit more deeply yourselves in the Canvas assignment that I'll have for you in a moment. So the first type of scale, perhaps the simplest, is called a nominal scale. It's simply a scale that indicates presence or absence, yes or no, or categorization across a series of options. There's no ranking, there's no preference, it's just a yes or no or category. So for instance, you can state which of these two you prefer. Do you prefer the Steelers player Ward or Palomalo? You're not saying how much more you prefer one over the other, simply stating a fact like I prefer Heinz Ward as my option of these two. Another typical example of a normal scale might be something like gender. You might say, I am male. That is a description. One is not better than the other. Male is not more or less than female. It's simply different. Slightly more sophisticated than a nominal scale is an ordinal scale. This is a scale where you indicate the ordered preference for something without defining how different that preference is. So maybe a little bit of an example to make this clear. If I ask people to rank order their favorite fruit, they can probably do that. So they might say that peach is their favorite, banana is their second favorite, and apple is their third favorite. Now what's critical is they're not saying how much more they prefer each of these fruits relative to the other, they're simply stating an order. So it's very possible that people prefer peaches way more than they prefer bananas, and they prefer bananas ever so slightly more than they prefer apples. You as a researcher would never know how big that difference is. You would only observe what's called the ordinality of choices. From a statistical perspective, again, we can't compute averages because, for example, it doesn't make any sense for a response to be something like 1.5 or 2.5 or 2.7. You either have a preference that is first, second, third, fourth, or fifth, and so on. Again, you have ordinality, but you don't have distance between options. Now, to make the case for those ordinal scales a little bit more cleanly, let me show you what this might look like. So if I have a scale that's like this, this would be a scale asking people, what's your highest level of attained education? Somebody could choose these options, and we can compute an average, but would it make any sense? So say that I compute that the average is 2.5. Does that make any sense at all? Can you have 2.5 education? Not really, and this is even more pronounced if we think about the distance between those options. They're not uniform. For instance, we can imagine the difference between having no degree of any kind and having a high school diploma is massive, and perhaps the difference between a high school diploma and college is smaller, and college and grad school is about the same as well. Now, we could also imagine totally different distances between these options, and that's the point. The point is, because there's not uniformity, we cannot compute things like an average value here. We can only count how many people respond to each option and look at relative frequencies. Moving to the most common scale, we have the interval scale. This is what we saw a moment ago with that likelihood to purchase question. It is a scale that is typically presented on a series of options, somewhere between five and seven is pretty typical. And some of the key assumptions are that the distance between each of those options are uniform. That is, going from one to two is the same as going from two to three in terms of the degree of change. So unlike our ordinal scales where we don't have that degree consistency, in interval scales that is baked into the assumption. And that's important because what this will allow us to do is compute things like means and medians and standard deviations and do all sorts of interesting statistics because it is the case that there is a value between one and two or between two and three. And this makes sense. If what we're trying to do is map some continuum that's in people's heads, that continuum doesn't have five discrete options, it is a continuum. 
And so we're simply using this numerical representation as a proxy for that continuum, which means that we can do things like compute averages and have values that are 2.3. And this brings us to our final scale, which is a ratio scale. Now, ratio scales are very similar to interval scales, with the key difference being that there's a meaningful zero point. And I'll explain what that is in just a second. Examples of ratio scales are things like willingness to pay when asked in dollar value, or height, or age. These are all things where zero matters, right? Zero dollars is a thing, zero inches is a thing, and zero years is a thing. It matters. And so we have that meaningful zero, and that makes a big difference. And I'll show you now why that's the case. So here's a ratio scale where we ask people willingness to pay. And let's imagine two groups of people, one group says $5, another group says $10. It is the case that $10 is $5 times two. In other words, the group that said $10 is willing to pay twice, I can make that claim, twice what that first group is willing to say. That might seem trivial, but compare it to an interval scale. Here's my interval likelihood to buy scale, and I'm gonna put it on a scale from one to five. If one group of people respond two, and another group of people respond four, it is the case that four is just double two but that is an incorrect interpretation. We cannot make statements like double or half or triple because there isn't a meaningful zero, and let me show you why. That first scale for willingness to pay, I can't change the meaning of five and $10. They are what they are. But for the second scale, for the interval scale, the numbers that I choose to put on those is absolutely arbitrary. For example, I can change my scale to this. This psychometrically captures the exact same thing. Five points, there's a continuum, we're measuring those. And if people respond in the same locations, that second option and that fourth option, as they did in the previous scale, well, what we would find is that one group has an average of one and another group has an average of negative one, but is one twice negative one? No, of course it's not, right? We see that right away. In other words, it's impossible to interpret it the same way. In fact, one is negative one times what negative one is, which makes no sense at all. And so we can't make those types of relative statements in terms of multiples, like twice or three times or half or a quarter. That's not something we can do with an interval scale. We can do that with a ratio scale. So this is the point where I'm gonna ask you to go back into Canvas, and there's a short quiz, and it's an ungraded quiz, it's just there to see if you understand the concepts, which will ask you to identify the different types of scales that we're using here. And in the next video, we'll actually debrief all of that so you get a sense of whether you got the intuition right or not.